and uh, welcome at the lecture given by Professor Wolf Moskovich about Yiddish and Bukovina, which is our great pleasure to host it here in Abayit. My name is Ivana, and I'm working for Paideya, the European Institute for Jewish Studies, and Paideya Fogoskola. And I'm really sorry if I'm speaking too fast, but this is like uh, my accent from Czech, Czech language that we are speaking so fast. But thank you very much for coming. Um, this event is organized in cooperation with Paideya, uh, the European Jewish Encounter, uh, uh, Ukrainska Institute in Stockholm, Jewish Community in Stockholm, and Bayit. Uh, what we are going to do today, we have like a full program and I would like to just tell you a few steps and then I will give a word to Natalia that she will introduce more uh, the program. Uh, so first we have a short introduction, then we will have a musical opening by actually director of the uh, Ukraine Institute, Natalia Pasichnik and uh, her sister Olga Pasichnik, they will play a song in Yiddish. Mm. Then we will have a short trial of the movie, Glimpses of Yiddish Chernovitz, so you, you can get a little bit grab of what Chernovitz is and also what Bukovina is. Then we have a lecture by Professor Moskovich, and then in the end we will have a question and answer. So please, if you have any questions, please keep it uh, after the sessions for question and answers. And uh, in the end we will have a musical closing again by Natalia and uh, Olga. Very nice. Mm. So now I will give word to... Natalia, yeah, we have two Natalias. <laughs> Natalia Fedushak from the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. So you can explain what you are doing. Thank you very much for coming tonight. This is, uh, it's so wonderful to see everybody here. This is the second time that uh, Ukrainian Jewish Encounter has had an event in Stockholm. And I have a feeling it's gonna be just as good as the last one. Um, very quickly. Ukrainian Jewish Encounter is now in its 10th year, um, and we are a privately funded Canadian nonprofit organization with the goal of bringing together uh, Ukrainians and Jews and having a discussion on a wide variety of, of issues. And, you know, our work is really far reaching, and one of the things that we do is we do try to bring our board members and people who work with our organization uh, to give them an opportunity to talk about the Ukrainian Jewish dialogue. I am thrilled today that Professor Moscovich is here in Stockholm. Um, he is Professor Emeritus at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, a board member of Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, but really a person who uh, started in many ways, Ukrainian studies in Israel, and who is a walking encyclopedia. And every time I listen to him, I am just enamored. I learn more and more about this world that in some ways um, is no longer with us physically, but it is with us uh, spiritually. And it is through people like uh, Professor Moscovich that this Yiddish, uh, uh, the language and its soul and the land of Bukovina and Chernivtsi, that it all continues to live on. Um, I will uh, end on that. I did want to say that I thank very much that uh, Ukraine's charge d'affaires, Olena Polunina, and uh, the first secretary, the second secretary, Katarina Tominska of the Ukrainian embassy are here uh, joining us this evening. And so I guess, Ivana, then we will um, wait for Natalia to um, come out and have our musical presentation and she will tell us about the music that is being played this evening. I am very happy that so many people find uh, as well this uh, subject very interesting and we thought maybe in the beginning to put you in the right mood and give you like the better like understanding and feeling of the this part of the world which will be covered to the, uh, today and so we will first start with a short music performance of three Jewish songs from the cycle, uh, nine popular Jewish songs from the, this part of the world, from this region. And um, they are, uh, the first one is about a coachman, which is saying that I'm just a little man and I am uh, driving people, sometimes it's a robber and they are screaming faster, faster and uh, sometimes it's women and then I have to listen on how they complain on life, so just vio and vio. And the second is the eternal question. 
the world is asking us tra la 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 la, we are answering tra la 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 la. If we are not answering tra la 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 la, the question eternal will be still tra la 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 la. Mm. And the last is about a young man sitting on a Friday night and preparing for uh, Shabbat. But he got a call to the war and he is to become a soldier. And they are in Yiddish, and as far as I understood, there is three kind of dialects of, of uh, pronunciation of Yiddish uh, Lithuanian, Polish, and Ukrainian. So we are going for Ukrainian. <laughs>
Now I would like to welcome uh, Professor Wolf Moskovich as uh, Natalia Sepp. <laughs> introduce, introduce Professor. Uh, he is a, uh, a member of uh, board member of, uh, of the European Jewish Encounter and also uh, one of the cornerstone of the Hebrew University and also Slavic Department. Uh, at last I see here representatives of the uh, Stockholm Jewish community. I'm very glad to see you. Tell me please how many of you uh, understand Yiddish? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, little bit. Okay. So, so uh, can you hear? Proportionately, proportionately, I won't speak much Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> I speak other languages. Uh, in, uh, I mean, English in this case. Uh, Chernobyl is known in the whole world as a city where the historical uh, Yiddish language conference took place in 1908, uh, where it was declared that Yiddish is a national uh, language of the Jews. Not the national language, but one of the national languages. Why uh, was this resolution taken there, that a national language, one, uh, because uh, there were representatives there of Zionists uh, who uh, protested against declaring Yiddish to be the sole national language of Jews. And uh, there was voting. As a result of voting at this conference, it was, the resolution was passed that it is uh, one of the two languages, uh, national languages of the Jews. At this conference were representatives of uh, various countries uh, and even continents, a representative of the United States uh, and of Russia, of uh, Tsarist Russia, of Poland, of uh, Romania, and uh, of uh, Austro-Hungary, because the country at that time was Austro-Hungary. Why the conference took place exactly in Chernobyl? Because it could have taken place anywhere, in any place, in St. Petersburg, or in New York, or in Paris, or in London, uh, or even in Stockholm, mm -hmm. because it was considered that there is a center of uh, Jewish life where Jews were given all the opportunities for developing their culture, mm -hmm. and uh, where the situation of Jews was better than in other places uh, in uh, Europe, in East Europe. Uh, you can tell me that the situation maybe was better in France, but it wasn't, because after the Dreyfus affair, uh, everybody understood that even in France there are problems. So uh, the conference uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, of the international media at that time. And it was so important that uh, by now, when we speak about Jewish culture in general and uh, traditional Jewish culture, uh, secular Jewish culture mainly, then we, we remember Chernovitz. Uh, Chernovitz uh, conf the Chernovitz conference uh, is a historical, a major historical event. And uh, after this conference, several times, there were commemorative conferences uh, in, uh, in memory, in, in honor of this first conference. I myself, I organized about four to five such conferences uh, uh, from the time when I was led back to Chernobyl because I, I, I left uh, the Soviet Union not so peacefully uh, uh, in the 1970s and since then it was prohibited for me to, to go back to this territory of the Soviet Union. But at the first opportunity in 1989 I came to Chernobyl. I delivered their lectures like I speak now before you to the Chernovitz uh, Jewish community. And after that, uh, I'm in Chernovitz almost every year, and I organize their conference, international, major international conferences, and publish books of, uh, uh, which were dedicated to Yiddish culture. Uh, uh, the last one conference was in uh, 2018, last year. 
and uh, every time we publish volumes of uh, whatever it is, proceedings of such conferences. And uh, uh, there we speak about the traditions of Chernobyl. Now, why Chernobyl in general is such a uh, exceptional place? The conference was organized by a person, I don't know if many of you have heard about this person, his name is Dr. Nathan Birnbaum. Dr. Nathan Birnbaum is a, pers a person that is forgotten un uh, unjustly today. He is the man who coined the term Zionism in, 19, uh, in 1890, before that. He was, in, 19, uh, in 1892, he coined the term political Zionism. He was the first to organize in Vienna uh, Zionist uh, organizations. And he was a sec the first secretary to Herzl of the World Zionist Organization. Uh, his period of being enchanted by Zionism <coughs> was for some time. It, uh, in general, his political uh, biography uh, shows how a Jew tries to find the solution of the so-called Jewish problem in Europe by various ways. So the first way was Zionism. It is to, to bring the Jews uh, from Europe to the Middle East, to Palestine, and to create there a Jewish state. And he was very active in that before Herzl and with Herzl as his secretary. But after several years of his work together with Herzl, uh, he became disenchanted in Zionism uh, for various reasons but uh, mainly uh, it was personal reasons because he was himself a very, very charismatic figure. Uh, you know that Herzl was a very charismatic person, but Nathan Birnbaum was no less charismatic than Theodor Herzl. And when, maybe it was a clash of personalities. In any case, he uh, <coughs> left Zionism and he got another idea. He got a, the idea which many Jews had at that time that in Europe there can be found a way of uh, e equality for Jews. And this way is connected with the so-called cultural autonomy of the Jewish people in Europe. And uh, it is closely connected with their national identity and their language, which is Yiddish. And that's why Nathan Birumbaum, he looked for a place where he can uh, put together a group of people who think the same way as him, and he organized the first, uh, this Yiddish conference in Chernowitz. He found such place in Chernowitz, because Chernowitz was famed, it was had a fame in the Jewish world as a place of inter-ethnic tolerance. Uh, I think that Nathan Birnbaum was to a greatest extent a kind of a prophet because he saw very, very to, to the future, to a very, very long uh, uh, and, and future ahead. Uh, to, uh, and uh, he saw many things which could have been in, uh, 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 materialized in Europe if the history went another way. But the history didn't go the way how he projected the future, that will be cultural autonomy possible in Europe. In any case, at this stage of his biography, he was for, na for, natural, uh, for uh, natural cultural autonomy for Jews. And Yiddish was a central, so to say, prerequisite for it. And then uh, in Austria, Yiddish was not cons uh, considered officially to be a national language. So he, together with some people whom he mobilized, they went to the parliament, to the Austrian parliament, and to the Austrian high court, and they demanded that Yiddish should be acknowledged by the liberal, but they were very, very liberal, the Austrian, uh, the Austrian politi po politics or politicians at the time, as a national language, the language of Jews. It wasn't given to them. Why? Because of a technical reason because the uh, high uh, court in Vienna, they said that it is true that all the population of Galicia, Bukovina, they speak Yiddish, 
But they can't declare it a national language, language of Jews in Austria because for the rest of Austria, Jews don't speak Yiddish, they spoke German. And that's why technically it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. But nevertheless, exactly in Chernobyl, in 1910, two years after the Chernobyl conference, there was uh, um, uh, reached the so-called uh, Ausgleich, the so-called uh, uh, evenness, uh, a, a situation in which Jews had the same representation in the local parliament of Bukovina as other nationalities. So that was a kind of a um, uh, uh, situation which was unprecedented in other places. After that, uh, the same uh, kind of uh, equalization was reached in another province of Austro-Hungary, uh, in uh, uh, Moravia, in Meren. Uh, that was the second stage of uh, Natan Birumal's political way. And now, uh, if I speak already about this extraordinary personality, I have to mention the third, uh, by the way, he relocated to Chernovitz, he lived there for several years. He promoted uh, this uh, case for Yiddish as a national language. And what is very interesting, I told you that it's a person who looked ahead. He saw that the way for Jews to find their rights in uh, these provinces in the, in the east of, of Austro-Hungarian Empire is to create political alliances with other nations. And he was instrumental in creating this uh, 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 alliance with Ukrainians. He, in 1907, uh, uh, he uh, pro proposed his candidacy for the Austrian parliament in the town of Buchach, uh, where uh, both Ukrainians and Jews voted for him. Unfortunately, in all these places of Galicia, uh, the Poles, uh, uh, the Polish political establishment, always wanted to have their people in the Austrian parliament. And they made all kinds of machinations in order not to let such people as Birnbaum to the parliament. He lost. But <clears throat> a very interesting photograph uh, remained. A photograph of all the Jewish uh, inhabitants of Buchach standing at the main square of Buchach, and at the head of them is Dr. Natan Birumbaum. Mm -hmm. So he saw this uh, way for Jews of cooperating politically with Ukrainians in, in, in Ukraine as one of the ways. It, he couldn't, whatever it is, he failed in that, but nevertheless, uh, he tried. Another person of the same persuasion was uh, uh, Zev Zhabotinsky, the very famous uh, Zionist leader, who also saw the same thing. And he offered his candidacy in the State Duma of Russia in 96 in Volinia. And again, he couldn't get into the Duma. He wanted to represent, so to say, the interests of his constituents, uh, Jews and Ukrainians, because again, there was a maneuver by the Polish establishment, and he couldn't get it. So, after that, he wrote about this importance of the, of the interaction of the joint uh, work, political, uh, of Jews together with Ukrainians on the territory of Ukraine. Now, uh, Yiddish at the, that time was um, one of the main languages of Chernobyl. Chernobyl is a, cit a city where 50% of the population was Jewish. Today, in, in Chernobyl, there are no more than a thousand Jews. Uh, once, there was no less than uh, 60, 70, 80,000 Jews in the, in the city. By now, uh, uh, these Chernovitsians who are not there, they are all over the world. And they're here in this hall. Two of the former Chernovitsians came to me here. I was glad to meet. Please, stand up, Chernovitsians. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah, there was another you are Chernovitsians are all over the world. 
uh, particularly, uh, my wife usually asks me, why there are so many Chernovitsians around the world? And the reason <laughs> is, the reason is simple. Chernovitz was on the border, always on the border of various countries. And therefore it was a, a place where population always, so to say, uh, had the possibility to travel. And uh, one traveler who came from Paris in 1924, he writes in his memoirs, I go to the main, in the main street of Chernovitz, and I see uh, everywhere the signs, the, the, the signs of um, companions of Lloyd's and other cruise companies. So how Chernovitz? which it doesn't have, doesn't stand on any kind of a sea, has so many sea companies. <laughs> and the reason is that there were so many people were traveling from Chernovitz and via Chernovitz and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was a city always which was, yes, uh, of, of, of uh, people who, who traveled, who came via this uh, city. Uh, it's a very beautiful city. It's a very lucky city. Do you know that Chernovitz is perhaps the only city in Eastern Europe where 20,000 Jews lived the whole world, world, world war in the city and they survived the war in the city. There was the same uh, 20,000. Some of the Chernovitz inhabitants were sent to, to the camps, Transnistria. But there was one person who was a righteous Gentile who was the mayor of Chernovitz. His name was a local uh, lawyer who knew Jews very well and who, had, who carried on the traditions of liberalism mm -hmm. of uh, Austro-Hungary. His name was Trajan Popovich, who is considered to be a righteous Gentile by uh, Yad Vashem. And there were other people who helped him. Who said to Antonescu, who was at that time the dictator of Romania, that he can't manage the uh, municipality affairs, all kinds of technical services of the city without Jews. And in this way, he was able to, uh, to, to live in, this, in the city about 20,000 Jews, and they survived, though he himself was uh, prosecuted by the Romanians, but nevertheless, these 20,000 remained there, while in Kishinev, Kishinev, which is very uh, city next to Chernovitz, all the Jewish population was killed off, no mm -hmm. Jews left. In Odessa, all the Jewish population was, was killed. In all the Galicia, there wasn't one, one place where uh, Jews remained, and Chernovitz remained such a kind of exceptional thing, 20,000. So how can it come? Mm -hmm. It's an exception, because it was traditions of this place. The traditions were traditions of tolerance in this place, which were actually started at the golden times of Chernovitz. It was the time of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. Chernovitz is being idealized now by all of these people, migrants, who came out of Chernovitz around the world. And if exactly these Jewish migrants from Chernovitz, they established a so-called myth of Chernovitz myth of Chernovitz as a golden city, as a city where everything is fine and wonderful. Uh, they forget about the problems which are connected with this time, because there isn't a place without problems. Uh, you, uh, you would say that the Chernovitz was, they, they didn't have anti-Semitism, it had it. It had it particularly during the Romanian time when uh, Jews were killed off, and uh, afterwards the Romanian occupation all that. It has its very, very dark period during the Second World War, although 20,000 were saved, but nevertheless, there were other things there. There were killings, there were murders, there were, there, were, there were pogroms and all that during the same period. So, uh, Chernobyl is not an ideal place. But <coughs> the memory of Chernobyl as an idealized place continues until today and became even a scholarly subject. How does it become a corporate scholarly subject? Uh, the, uh, there is a woman who was actually born of Chernovitsian Jewish parents. Her name is Mariana Hirsch. 
but he's a, she's a professor at Columbia University, and she started a whole field new of knowledge, which is called post-memory. What is post-memory? Post-memory is she listens to the idealized stories of her parents. Memory is memory, which is a kind of a memory which mirrors the memory of her parents. So there is a new field, which is called post-memory. So there is this idealization of the past at some of the, uh, uh, some of the, of the historians and some of the researchers. But what was uh, the real situation? The real situation was such that Jews had to fight for their equality. It doesn't come, you know, by itself. There, was, uh, there were political parties at the, at the time of uh, Austro-Hungarians. There was a party which is, was, uh, which was uh, uh, Polish party, and then there was a Ukrainian party, and then there was a Romanian party, it was a Jewish national party. And these parties, they fought with their representatives for equality in this place. The specificity of Bukovina, and why Bukovina in general, uh, Chernovitz and Bukovina could become such a tolerant place where everybody had the equal rights, was that no nationality in Chernovitz had majority. Everybody was a minority. Mm -hmm. So there were so many minorities, there's minorities. Volans know this, whether they wanted or didn't they want, they had to find a common language. And that was not an easy thing to do. So they tried their best. So there were 11 different ethnic groups in Bukovina. They belonged to nine different confessions. And they had to find, uh, to, 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 to have their rights. So I uh, read for many hours, for example, uh, read uh, um, reports, uh, the stenograms uh, of the local Bukovinian parliament, of the debates. And I followed the, the line of whatever it is of, of, of their discussions. And I saw that the interests were quite, you know, not the same. Their interests were, uh, were, were, were different from different people, different uh, groups, particularly different of the Germans, because the Germans, uh, they were the so-called leading group there. Uh, it was their state, the Austrian state and all that. Romanians as well. So uh, the Jews found a way of cooperating with various minorities in order to fight for their rights. And very often they've done it with the Ukrainian minority. And together they found together, they fought for their rights and they got their rights. Mm -hmm. um, there were two cities in Eastern Europe where German was the main language of Jews. One was Brode, which was a major center uh, of commerce between Tsarist Russia and, uh, and Austria-Hungary. And another was Chernobyl, which was also a trade, major trade center between the two countries. The border between Russia and, uh, and uh, Austria-Hungary was 30 kilometers from Chernobyl in the town of Snow Service. In this particular two places, the gymnasiums, the local schools, were in German. And these gymnasiums are very, very good quality schools. And they created a whole generation, several generations of Jews who, for whom the language, uh, whatever the main language was German. And therefore, the population of Chernobyl, who by uh, their origin are Jews and the language is Yiddish. And Yiddish is a language, as you know, is very, very close, like Swedish is very close to to, to German, other Germanic languages, so Yiddish is also a Germanic language that split off the German language quite late, uh, somewhere in the, in the 30, 12th, 13th century. So uh, the languages are very close. So the population spoke a kind at first a mixture of both languages, of uh, German and Yiddish. And uh, Chernobyl is situated on a big uh, hill the hill runs from the <coughs> river, which is called Prut, and up hill. And uh, as uh, down at the river, that was the oldest part of the, of the city. And there the Jews settled. There was their marketplace. And there Jews 
spoke Yiddish from the very beginning of the city until today, actually. They speak Yiddish. And then when he went uphill, when Jews became a bit richer, mm -hmm. they went up, they bought houses up the hill. And then when you go up the hill, you have every time on every street, you have less Yiddish in the mixture of more German. Mm -hmm. And then when you come to the top, you have only German uh, with some Yiddish ex expressions, but not more than that. But when you have Yiddish, Yiddish you have also in the speech of, this, of these Jews, but Yiddish you have in the speech of all the nationalities of uh, Germans. Also Ukrainians have Yiddish elements, and many Ukrainians knew Yiddish as a language. Romanians have, mm -hmm. Germans, and so on and so forth. So there is a special language, German language, very, very developed, which is called Chernovitserish. <laughs> Chernovitserish is a language <laughs> which has in it uh, John, German and which has in it Yiddish, a lot of Yiddish. Uh, therefore, Chernovitz was able, because of the very high cultural level of this group, of this city population, cre create major uh, literary figures, major uh, writers came out of Chernovitz. But for some reason, Chernovitz gave more poets than prosaic authors. They say that those Jews who wrote German, they wrote prose in Prague, for some reason, Kafka, uh, Broad, and so on and so forth. And they wrote poetry in uh, Chernovitz, like mm -hmm. Paul Celan, Emmanuel Weislas, uh, <coughs> Rosa Auslander, and so on and so forth. The names that I mentioned now, Celan and Auslander, are number one and two in German poetry in general of the 20th century. How can it be that a country which was not anymore belonged to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austro-Hungarian Empire ended in Chernobyl in 1918. After 1918, Romanians came in. And Romanians didn't give possibility for German culture to develop in Chernobyl. And uh, nevertheless, exactly in Chernobyl, appeared a whole number of absolutely outstanding German poets, which continued the line of poetry of, uh, of, of Heine, of Rilke, of Trakl, of various uh, outstanding uh, German poets. And uh, the foremost of them was Paul Zeran. And this thing, the scholars can't explain even today. But if I try to find an explanation, how does it come that such major poetry could, could be outside the German, so to say, cultural uh, whatever realm, cultural area, in, in the situation where all cultures except Romanians were persecuted at that time, during Romanian time, the answer is very simple. Jews preserve very often things to which they belonged before, but for many generations. In this way, you see how Hasidim are dressed like were dressed in the 16th century. In this way, you see how Yiddish, which is a language, a Germanic language, was uh, preserved until today. And uh, so, in the same way, Jew uh, German culture was preserved by Jews, exactly by Jews, by so inertia, by tradition, for a longer time than the Austrian rule uh, continued there. All the poets that wrote in uh, various nationalities, who wrote in Bukovina, in Chernovitz, the first poems that they wrote were in German. All of them. If you take, for example, the Ukrainian poetess Kobelianska, she started to write in German and then went to Ukraine. If you take the, high, the best, absolutely best, foremost, Romanian uh, author, Romanian poet, Mikhail Venescu, he started to write in German, and then went on. And the same is, con uh, is with Yiddish poets, who started in German, but they continued to Yiddish. 
and one of them is the most outstanding poet, as I consider him, in the Yiddish culture of the 20th century, is uh, Itzik Manger. Mm. Itzik Manger is a poet of outstanding, absolutely, uh, force. Uh, and he knew, uh, he was born in Chernobyl. He, uh, um, he graduated from the local school. He, start, he was absolutely permeated by, Jew, by German and Yiddish culture. He was a son of a tailor. Uh, from uh, he knew the masses of Jews who spoke Yiddish in this part of town, which I tell you was a city which is next to the to the to the marketplace and river, and he uh, uh, all of all of that gave him possibility to reflect in his poetry uh, the soul, the the the, the Yiddish soul. Um, Chernovitz had. In all times at that time, not more than 100, 100,000 or 150,000 people, small place. It didn't have possibility to, for further development for young people. And therefore, poets like Paul Salan left and went first to Bucharest, and then he went to Paris, and he wrote everything that he wrote in Paris. Rosa Auslander went to America, and then she returned to Europe and became a major uh, poet. She lived in Dusseldorf, of, in um, Germany. And so Itzik Manger, the Yiddish poet, he went first to Romania, where he uh, spoke, uh, where, where he uh, was uh, giving um, uh, just uh, evenings of uh, recital of his poetry in various Romanian cities. And then he went over to the main center of Yiddish and, Jum and uh, Jewish culture in uh, interwar uh, Europe. It was Warsaw. And there in Warsaw, he really became one of the leaders, actually, leading figures of the Yiddish uh, cultural scene. Um, the war he passed in London, and then he went uh, for a short time in America, and he uh, finished his life in uh, Israel. If he would have come to Israel earlier than he came in the 1960s, he would have become a national poet of Israel. But he came too late. He was already uh, older, and he was not in very good uh, health. Uh, uh, to give you a, a feeling of what Isaac Munger is, I want to tell you that Isaac Munger uh, when you hear his uh, poetry, his uh, verses, you don't know whether it is written by one person or whether it is written, generally it is a folk, uh, uh, um, whatever poem, mm -hmm. or a folk uh, song. I'll read, for, uh, I'll read for you several lines and uh, you will understand the, the, the melody of it. Zok, uh, one moment. Do you know the Yiddish song, Oi von Weg steht a Boim? Yes. Yes, yes. So it goes, Oi von Weg steht a Boim, steht er und die Beugen, alle Fädel von dem Boim, seinen sich zu fliegen. There stands a, uh, a tree on the road. It is a bit uh, crooked, a bit uh, lent to the, to the, to the to the ground, all the uh, uh, all, 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 all the um, fagel, what fagel is it? Birds uh, from from this tree have have left it, uh, have uh, fl flown in, in different directions. Dreiken Meirev, Dreiken Misrach, unter Esch kein Dorem, unter Boim gelost allein, Hefker farm Sturm. Three went to the west, three went to the east, and the rest went uh, to, to the south. And they left the, the tree uh, alone before the, 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 the wind of the storm. Zogich zu der Mamen, Herr, Zolstich nordnischtern, 
wenig Mame, eins und zwei, bleib bald auf Eugel werden. I tell to my ma ma mother, listen to me. You should be in my way. I want one and two, just immediately. I want to become a, uh, a bird. Ich will sitzen auf dem Boim und will ihn verwiegen über Winter uh, mit der mit, mit, mit der Trist, mit der schönen Nieden. I will sit on a, on a tree, or I will lull, lull the tree. Uh, we, I will comfort the tree with a, with a beautiful song, and so on and so forth. So everybody whom I ask, they consider this, this uh, song to be a folk song. It's not, it's not written by one person. But what is interesting about this uh, song is that this song is sounds like one of the of the of the song of the songs which are typical for Yiddish uh, folklore. There was uh, only another author like that from Kiev. His name was Mark Warshavsky, who was able to create Yiddish songs, <coughs> which nobody could say that they are created. Uh, they are uh, a product of one person. Everybody thought that they are. Uh, popular uh, folk songs. Uh, so this is the quality, the high quality of his poetry. Uh, uh, Munger Prize exists today in Israel, considered to be the highest literary prize for Yiddish poetry uh, in the world. Uh, he wasn't alone. Uh, he was a uh, one of a whole group of writers in Chernobyl. Uh, Eliezer Steinberg uh, was somebody who wrote fables uh, in Yiddish. Uh, there was another one, Yankev Sternberg, who was uh, a dramatist. He, he, he was a playwright. Uh, there was Moshe Altman, who is considered to be one of the greatest uh, uh, prosaic writers in the world. Uh, so Chernovitz gave Yiddish literature quite a number of outstanding uh, figures. When I was a child, I was able to walk in Chernovitz's streets and not using any other language but only Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, somewhere in the beginning of the 1950s. I walk in the street and all it's summer, all the windows are open and uh, from one window I hear the voice of Israel radio program in Yiddish the beginning of the phrase I go further I, begin, I, I hear the, the, net, the continuation of this phrase from the next window everything open everything whatever it is everything is uh, absolutely I mean uh, you could go and you cannot know any other language but Yiddish and you could ma uh, you can manage with one language because everybody would know Yiddish everybody would know Yiddish. Uh, well it was 1950s but why was it possible 1950s because in 1950s the population has changed because all the population as I told you who spoke German and Yiddish at that time all left Germans in 1946, uh, there was a, a, um, a uh, kind of an order from Kiev by Khrushchev, who said that Jews are a parasitic element, and uh, spe they speculators, and therefore they have to, to be exiled from Chernovitz, and Jews were caught on the streets, they were put on, uh, on, on trucks, and they were, as they were, exp uh, whatever it is, sent to the Romanian border. Mm -hmm. In this way, many, many old Chernovitsians, they were not anymore there. Uh, other Chernovitsians left by their own will, because everybody wanted to, they understood that if you go to, to Romania and all that, you can continue your way to Eretz Israel, to other places, and all that and all that. But there was also this kind of, I haven't heard anything of this kind anywhere. I tell you that Chernovitz is a very lucky city from many, many points of view. Its architecture is absolutely remained as it was before. 
there were only two buildings which were destroyed in the Second World War. Uh, there, uh, I mean, one building was destroyed by the Germans, that was the synagogue, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and another building was a pl place uh, next to the post office where they, the Russians collected their radio uh, apparatus because they confis confiscated for some reason radio apparatus from the population, and then for some reason they exploded. All the rest of Chernobyl remained uh, standing. It is an architectural treasure. Chernovitz is an, a major, major tourist object today because, and it lives of tourism, because uh, Chernovitz is uh, it's extremely, extremely attractive. It has a university co complex, which is the, perhaps the most uh, beautiful in Europe. It was the former palace of the uh, metropolitan of Chernovitz. Uh, it is a, so. Even today, in Chernobyl, in a couple of, well, today, today is the beginning of September. In a couple of days, uh, from the 5th of September, 3rd of September, in Chernobyl, uh, will be uh, one of the cultural events which is supported, in which I work in Jewish-Ukrainian encounter, which is called Meridian. Which, what is Meridian? Meridian is a festival of poetry uh, where, uh, where the poets from Europe and all over the world come there in honor of Paul Celan, the great Chernobyl's poet, and they, uh, and they um, recite poetry, their own poetry, in various languages. They come from Europe, they come from America, they come from, from Israel, and they recite their poetry. And some of it uh, takes place next to the tombstone of Eliezer Steinberg, the great author of the interwar period in, in Chernobyl, and uh, uh, with uh, recitals, uh, this uh, um, this is a major cultural event. The only problem of Chernobyl is that Chernobyl has a very bad transportation. Uh, it is in such a way situated that you can't get to it easily from any point. So uh, that was prevents it from becoming more known, whatever it is, and more visited than it is uh, today. In 1884, uh, a Chernovitz doctor, whose name is Yaakov Flinker, published in the local newspaper uh, Bukowiner Rundschau, an article which is called Chernovitz in 2010. The year was 1884. How he sees Chernovitz, how it would be. So in 1884, you know, I told you that Chernovitz has traditions and all that. He writes this, the, same ta the same way as today. All the nationalities, all the ethnicities will live in, in peace and, and, and agreement and all that, which is for sure true. Uh, the Jews are not there present so much. Then uh, he writes that there'll be a, um, uh, the, all the town that you see now, everything that you see now, won't look like it sees now. There'll be huge buildings made of aluminium <laughs> and, 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 and steel uh, everywhere, multi-story buildings. And there'll be an electromagnetic train which will connect Chernobyl with other places, which will in, all, in no time. So his vision is a very, very interesting. So that's how they saw the projection into the future. But what is interesting is that, first of all, Chernovitz had a potential from that time to be a very tolerant place. And that was that helped the Jews during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Chernovitz had also a potential of being a major cultural center. And that's what I tell you and, uh, and I told you. A major cultural center, it means major cultural figures, major poets, scholars come there, of, uh, which I don't speak now today, but nevertheless. A very interesting thing, that the first professor of Yiddish in the world comes, be, be, became, uh, got his position also because of the Chernobyl conference. How does it come? I told you that Nathan Birnbaum, who had two, uh, so to say, um, uh, stages in his <coughs> worldview how to, 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 to help Jews. One was Zionism. Another was cultural autonomy, and then there came a third change. Uh, change. By 1914, he said he was disillusioned by Yiddish and all of that. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, no, that's not the way. The way is to become ultra-religious. And he became ultra-religious. And he became the head of Agudat Israel, Agudat Israel. Okay? He was the general secretary of, well, uh, of the secular, well, Jewish uh, organization, as I told you, and then he was, after so many years, he became the head of Agudas Sisro, of, of, the, of the, everybody knows, for sure, what Agudas Sisro is. It's a major ultra-Orthodox political yes. party uh, among Jews. So uh, he became head of, that was the third case. His son, who was Shloime Solomon Pirombaum, he, his son, uh, also became ultra-Orthodox, but in addition to it, he inherited one thing. He inherited his love of Yiddish of his father. Mm -hmm. And he continued studying Yiddish and being a scholar, of Yiddish scholar. And that's how, in 1926, where there was a decision in Germany to create a department of Yiddish in Hamburg, he became the first professor of Yiddish in Hamburg University. Mm. He lived a very long life. He wrote major books. He survived the Second World War. He wrote uh, major books on Yiddish and all that, but also a consequence of the co conference. So uh, there is an anecdote among Jews. Uh, Sholom Aleichem describes it in one of his, Sholom Aleichem, who couldn't himself come to the conference in 1908 because he was ill at that time. As you know, he died in eight years after that in, 19, in 1916 in New York. Sholom <coughs> nevertheless, reflected Chernovitz in his writings. And one of his uh, feuilletons he writes, so in a certain town, which is Kastrilevke, Kastrilevke for him is a, uh, is a kind of embodiment of Jewish statue. There are two, two parties, they're divided. One party and they are in conflict, the two, the two political parties of Jews. One party calls out, they shout, Herzl, Herzl. And the other party shouts, Chernobyl, Chernobyl. <laughs> so one party is Zionist, the other party is Yiddish. Okay? So that's how Chernobyl is important. It is extremely important for Jews. Uh, so um, in Chernobyl, there were 15 different newspapers in German during the war, and there were at least four or five in Yiddish. Uh, this uh, kind of whatever, so Yiddish culture continued uh, also during the time of interwar period. As I told you, it continued after, during the war, after the war period, I, I described to you uh, in the 1950s. Uh, it is interesting that the first Jewish political organization in the Soviet Union, for organized Jews, uh, was created in Chernobyl in, in Ukraine in 1988, during the, before the perestroika, yeah? Perestroika started. Uh, a Yiddish radio program existed in Chernobyl until 2001. There was a Yiddish cultural, a Yiddish language program for the population. And then, when the last already uh, speaker of this whatever radio, uh, he passed away. After that, the, the, the program was closed. You in Sweden must understand this very, very well because you are supported. Yiddish is supported by the government, as far as I understand, uh, and that's one of the few places where Yiddish uh, books in Yiddish for children are being published. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm informed, okay? But as a time of this, uh, okay, uh, the Yiddish prospects of Yiddish uh, were diminished and actually were annihilated by the Shoah. Mm -hmm. If they wouldn't have a Shoah, all these dreams of the Chernobyl Conference would have come true. There was a political party which is uh, close to communism, which is called Bund, which, which uh, for, for, for whom Yiddish was the main, so to say, language. The Bund in Chernobyl 
Uh, and uh, there was another political party which is called Poale Israel, uh, who also, uh, the left part of the party, considered Yiddish and not Hebrew to be a, a acknowledged natural language. They created in Chernovitz, after the conference, a huge Yiddish library. A uh, special school, school for young people who can, uh, 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 who can acquire professions for, for poor Jews. That can, a uh, Yiddish seminary uh, for teachers. A, uh, a, a Yiddish cultural club, which is now uh, in uh, whatever it is, if it's a big, big uh, Hall where there were Jewish films were, were, were shown and uh, uh, groups uh, theatrical were performing and all that. And that was in one city in Chavez. Today, unfortunately, the situation is a bit different because the Jews are not there. But the tradition came from there and it irradiated throughout the world. So Chavez is a very, very important uh, place uh, for, for, for Jewish uh, um, history of the 20th century. Uh, there are certain points in Chernovitz history that I would like to, to remind whatever it is to myself and to, to tell you. One of them is that when the Chernovitz main synagogue was, was built in, 19, in the 19, in 1870s, the cornerstone of the synagogue was put into, I mean, put, uh, erected there, put together with the chief rabbi and the metropolitan of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, Ukraine, of the, of the main church there, of Pravoslav church. It is unprecedented in Europe, the cornerstone, 1973, should do that. It shows you the atmosphere at that time. Now comes Chernobyl didn't know any pogroms during the Austrian time until the Russian army came in 1915. When they came, the Russians, they murdered all the Jews that they met on their way. The same metropolitan of, uh, who was very, very friendly to Jews asked the rabbi to give him all the Torah scrolls from the, from the synagogue to preserve them and he preserved them during the whole First World War and gave them back when the war ended. Mm. Then he declared to all the population of Jews, I hear that there are many uh, acts of uh, violence and rape of the Russian soldiers and all that. I open the doors of, the, my, my, of my residence to all Jewish girls who don't feel safe mm. to stay with me here in order to save you from, from such such things. Have you heard of it anywhere? That's Chernobyl, that's a, that's, a, that's a city. That is the, 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 the atmosphere, that is the, the tradition of the place. Uh, and, the, the, and therefore it's no wonder that 20,000 Jews survived in this way, being helped uh, in the city. Uh, I would tell you everything if I wouldn't have again mentioned that Chernovitz is a major center of Hasidism. Two uh, major Hasidic sects, Hasidic whatever courts, one of them, Sada Gerer, have you heard? Sada Gerer Hasidim, mm -hmm. and another sect, Vizhnitsev Hasidim, come from this place, from Chernobyl. To this come several other courts, which are not so well known. By now, the centers of these courts are in uh, Israel, in Nebrak, in Jerusalem, or in Monso, in, uh, in, uh, in New York, in the United States. They come from this place. All the Hasidim spoke Yiddish. That was the base, the democratic base. If you look one generation back, the <coughs> father of Paul Celan was one of the Hasidim, the father of, of the German poet Paul Celan, the, the, the father of uh, 
uh, of Rosa Auslander, another major poet, was a Hasid. So you have, in one generation, you have Hasidim, and then you have the next generation, you have the, their children, part of them became secular already, and they joined the secular stream of culture. Uh, today, the situation of uh, Yiddish culture is different, uh, but I'll leave it to your questions. <laughs> Thank you, so, thank you very much for the great lecture. And is there any questions? I guess there are a lot of questions. So, yeah, please. Do you need a microphone or it's fine? No, I don't need I just uh, wonder. Uh, whether you know uh, about some special address that I have a connection to, because I was born in the house of I Isaac Iskovich in Pardusa, <coughs> Pardusa 15, and uh, uh, and I don't know. Uh, it is very. It was a very beautiful house, uh, and the prescription Isaacovich is still there. I don't know how how is it now. Because then we moved to Shorsa. Yes. I understand. Okay. But, uh, put so you went up. You went up on the stuff. on the. You be, went up the hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, he, uh, the uh, is uh, is. Uh, it seems to be he was a photographer or something like that uh, mm. during the Romanian times. Mm. Though his name is spelled in a way like a uh, Galician Jew, so in a Polish way, the house exists until today. It is painted very, very beautiful. Yeah. Many tourists come there to look at yeah. it. It's a one-story small house. <laughs> and uh, so it is preserved quite well. So you can, you can go, but yeah, I'm very glad for you that you could change from this little place. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other questions? Give me my phone. Uh, first, you, <coughs> sorry, you mentioned that there were many <coughs> minorities, that yes. everyone was a minority, and you gave a very rosy picture of living together without many tensions. But I s suspect there were still tensions between different I told about groups. And so can you please tell a little more about which minorities lived there and what kind of okay. contradictions were there? Okay. There were four major groups in Chernobyl. There were the Germans who came there as Swedians. Uh, they were colonists, German colonists, who had their own quarter in Chernobyl, uh, about 10,000 people. There were Romanians. Uh, they are mainly uh, quite many of them rich people who had their estates uh, around Chernobyl and who were very well represented politically. Uh, there were Ukrainians who were peasants mainly from uh, uh, villages around the city. Uh, and there were Jews. Uh, by origin, these Jews were local autochton Jews because they were there from times in the memorial part of it. And many of them came to Bukovina from Galicia because uh, Bukovina was a place where there were many, many forests and the uh, Austrians wanted to develop it and therefore they uh, gave migrants possibility to come there and not to pay taxes and therefore lots of Jews from Galicia and from other places came there. Uh, that is, and then there, was, there were Russians, ethnic Russians, who belonged to the so-called uh, Lipovan church, and it's a church, church of Lipovci, or this uh, church which was a kind of, uh, mm, uh, of split, they split in the 16th century from the main Russian Pravoslav church, who, who were persecuted by the Russians, therefore they mm -hmm. ran away to various other places, and those of them, and their cultural center is not cl close to Germans. Uh, then there were some Hungarians, uh, not many. Then there were Poles, 15,000 Poles in the city, because next to it there was uh, Galicia, and from Galicia came the Poles. Now, I spoke about the 
atmosphere of tolerance and all that. But I told also that it wasn't so easy for Jews to gain their rights, and they're fighting for it. And they found uh, also allies in their fight. For example, anti-Semitism was very, very much present there, and very much present on the side of, from the side of the Germans, who hated Jews terribly and uh, whatever discriminated them. And it wasn't and it wasn't fair because uh, Yiddish was not acknowledged to be a national language separate from whatever it is, a separate national language. Therefore, by the way, elections, all the Jews were mm, demographically included into the German, so to say, uh, into the German, so to say, minority. So artificially, the number of Germans was presented as being more than they were. Uh, now, also, uh, there were economic problems because uh, Jews were buying off land from the peasants, and the peasants were not happy with that. And when you analyze uh, stories of uh, Bukovinian peasants who had to migrate from uh, Bukovina to Canada, for example, you find there that the reason for my immigration was that the land was appropriated by a Jew. Because Jew, Jew were, were, were keeping, you know, pubs and all of that, and uh, Ukrainians were drinking there and all that. When you analyze the uh, Ukrainian uh, national songs, uh, you find there whatever it is, songs about how a Jew, he gives you vodka, uh, whatever it is, and, but he himself doesn't drink, and you drink, and then you lose whatever you have and all that. So uh, there wasn't much love there because of that, yes. So there was this kind of thing, yes. Uh, now, from the, uh, so there were all kinds of Jews. There were Jews nice, and there were Jews who were considered not to be so nice. Uh, there were all kinds of things. There were economic, uh, so to say, competition. For example, I was uh, very, very much, uh, whatever it is, astonished when I saw that the West anti-Semites in this area, why Armenians? There is an Armenian church in Germany. Why Armenians? And Armenians in Yiddish are called Moch Otimche. What does it mean Moch Otimche? Moch Otimche in the Bible means Timche et, uh, Timche et Hashem, Adonai Timche et Hashem Shel Amalek. Ole Amalek. It means uh, the, the worst enemy of Jews. Why? What's the reason? Why exactly Armenians? Because Armenians were Christians. As Christians, we didn't have any limitations in trade and all that. They didn't have. Jews had limitations because they weren't Christians. And therefore, Armenians traditionally, they, had, they were in the same trades, in the same things, but they had more freedom. They were, so to say, positively discriminated against Jews. And therefore, as competitors, they were Jewish competitors. You know that in present-day Russia, Jews are no more present, so to say, there. They're not there. The Jews already emigrated, most of them. And then, hatred against Jews, and they said, it's shifted to somebody else. Who are the somebody else? Somebody else, Armenians. Because they're in the same professions, in the same, so to say, profile. Their profile, mm -hmm. professional profile, is more or less the same as Jews, because they're also pe migrants. They're also people who had to migrate from their motherland and all that. They're also a minority everywhere and all that. So historically, there was this kind of uh, this. So there were, there were uh, tensions. And these tensions were particularly very hard in the local parliament. And that's why I mentioned these discussions in local parliament, where there is this kind of things. But, but, during the golden time of Austro-Hungary, 143 years, from the year 1775, when Bukovina was uh, included into Austro-Hungarian Empire, until the year 1918, when the Austrian Empire ceased to exist, there was no pogrom by the hand of the local population against Jews. The only pogrom was done by invading Russian army who came in 1915, and then 1916, and then 1917, and then 1918, uh, 
came Romanians and they made a pogrom from the Romanian side. But inside Bukovina, there wasn't such a tradition. A Russian uh, aristocrat whose name was Elisabetta de Witte came as a tourist to Chernobyl in 1903. The train, which is the same train as runs now from Kiev to from Moscow, Kiev and to Chernobyl, uh, stopped there, and the conductor of the train declared Mazel Tov, we came to Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> so she asked, what do you have in mind? Is it capital or Jews? <coughs> okay. So she went, she took a, uh, a carriage, because, and uh, she came with this carriage, she went further on, and she asked the Balagula, and we had a song about Balagula today, she asked the, the, the driver, tell me please, she said, uh, what is here with Jews, whatever situation? And the Balagula answers there, the Jews, he said, only if we would have, if we, Kaiser, K, K, uh, uh, the, says, the, 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 the emperor, not the emperor, the emperor, the emperor, Kaiser, the emperor, would give, would give us the freedom for one day. We would roughen them up. It means beat them up a bit. Mm. She said, but roughen them up? Only roughen them up? What about exiling them? No, why exiling them? They're okay, whatever it is. She said they, they didn't, he didn't hear about Spain in the Middle Ages and other things. He, uh, whatever it is, he, he, he wasn't aware of, 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 of he was rather what, soft, okay? And that is, Chernobyl at that time, soft. <laughs> so you ask me whether it was there, it was natural. Human beings, are, there isn't a place in the world where there is no antisemitism. Simply there isn't a okay. So somebody asked, well, what, what shall we do about, uh, Jews asked, what shall we do about antisemitism? Nothing, because you can't, it exists, okay, it exists. <laughs> So uh, the same thing in Bukovina, it existed. But the interesting thing, how it was dealt with by the Austrian government, how it was dealt with by, by the local authorities, how it was reflected in day-to-day -day life of the Jews, how it was reflected in their fate during the Second World War, this tradition, mm -hmm. that is interesting. And that's what I wanted to somehow mm -hmm. to give you. I'll, I'll try. Could you just give us a brief glimpse of Jewish life today in Chernobyl? In Chernobyl? Yes. Wonderful. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> first of all, who are, first of all, I rarely saw a group of Jews who live who love their city so much as Homer Chernobyl. Never. I never saw any other group like that. They love their city. One of them is uh, my friend Yosef Zizos, who is from the same place. What did he do? He is very instrumental in uh, public work and all that. He was the one that organized the Jewish Society in 1988. Uh, he, he opened, he first, he first established a Jewish new, uh, new, new, a newspaper in 1981. Uh, he now uh, builds on the Yiddish um, cemetery, a big museum which is uh, dedicated to the Holocaust of Bukovinian Jews. He created on his own money a museum already of the past history of the Austrian times and all that. He's done all of that. We were discussing with him how to resurrect the building of the former, uh, so to say, uh, great synagogue that was destroyed by the Germans. Uh, there was one person 
who organized all these activities. Most of the Jews today, journalists, are elderly people. They receive support from an organization which is called Chesed Shoshan, which have like a cultural club, and they have parcels which are sent by various organizations, by Jewish organizations, like joint, by Israeli organization and all that, and they have quite a rich cultural program and all that. That's one group of population. Another group of population are businessmen. Israel now exports businessmen or around the world. It exported businessmen to Chinese as well. And so you have their younger people who are businessmen in various capacities and all that, who are operating in Chinese in Bukhulina. There are quite a number. There are enough of them to organize a kindergarten for their children, Jewish. In Chinese, there is a Jewish uh, school. Yes. Most of the students are not Jews. <laughs> but they have to give a bribe in order to get there. <laughs> or they have to invent Jewish documents in order to get it, because the best school in, in town. Okay? <laughs> school number 43. <laughs> yeah. Not far away from your second uh, Now, uh, that is it. Now, journalists. Uh, Zissels got money for restoring one of the synagogues. It was built from scratch, a new synagogue. A Lubavitch Rebbe came in. He's very active, he's young, energetic. There is rich Jewish life for whoever it is there. Whoever comes there, there is a kosher kitchen where I had the privilege to be there when I was there organizing my last and all the delegates of our conference last year. That is Shadowist today. There is a website. And on this website, all the news of Jewish Shadowists are published every day. In what language? In English. <laughs> okay, so that is fine in Ukrainian as well. So that's it. So, I mean, the local authorities in Ukraine, I can't say a bad word, a word against them. They're doing everything to help. Every word you ask, is done, immediately done. You want that, it's done. Sometimes it's not so easy, but it's done. It's done. People have their problems. It's a very poor country, Ukraine, today. You have to understand it. There is a huge emigration of local population for a gastarbeiter to all kinds of places and all that. They have their own, people have all their own problems. Jews comparatively are well off there. Their elderly people are taken care of. Their religious, whatever it is, needs are taken care of. I didn't, uh, didn't uh, uh, mention that this is the third synagogue in Israel, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Germany. There are three synagogues in Germany for this little population. I don't know how they get minyan, but, uh, but, but they do it. Kosher kitchen, kid, Jewish kindergarten. What do you want? Jewish school, what do you want? I have my own, so to say, uh, so to say, how to say, uh, uh, my own demands which are not met, for example. Uh, expectations. Uh, I would ex expect that in such a city in China, there should be at the university some, some course of Yiddish, and it isn't there. Everything's fine, but Yiddish is not there. It is next, it, to ne next city, you have to go to, to, to Lviv, which is next to Chernobyl, in order to study Yiddish. In Chernobyl itself, you can't, because there isn't such a thing at the university. Uh, all the other things are met, Everything, all the needs, absolutely. So what about anti-Semitism? Exists as always. <laughs> For sure. It always exists, always. There isn't such a place in the world that there isn't anti-Semitism. And whether Jews are even absent or next to absent. Will also be absent. Take the situation in Poland today. <laughs> okay? Or next to absent. <laughs> Four more questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You mentioned the, the Jewish parties in the old time, Arka Israel and, and the left Zionists and, and boom. It, the, the Bund and the left Zionists was strongly anti-religious. Yes, they were. So there were probably clashes. Between well, that's already the Jewish, internal Jewish world. <laughs> well, there are two Jews, there are three synagogues, as you know, and all of that and all that, for sure. We'll look at, at modern Israel today, yes? What is the main agenda of the elections which are taking place on the 17th of September? What's the main thing? The main thing came out one person and said, we don't want any more these religious parties in the parliament. Yeah. We wanted to create a secular government and then because they are parasites, they're exploiting and all that and all that. Okay, so <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> yeah, I have a question about the, the war years there. You, you mentioned that 20,000 lived, survived, saved by the mayor, of, yes. of the city. Yes. So my father was born in 1939 in Chernobyl, and and his father also from Chernobyl. Why did you send up when I asked him Chernobyl? Why? I, You're modest. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> so the question is, uh, my father's grandfather from Chernobyl, he was uh, the head of the family, and uh, he lived. He survived and. Uh, moved to Israel in 1951, and I think he, he, he died the year after. But he lived, and his, but, but his wife, and his daughter, and his sister were taken to the concentration camp in Transnistria. But uh, his uh, <coughs> four sons, my grandfather and also my father and their children, they, they live. So how was, uh, who was uh, chosen to, uh, to go, uh, to, who, how were they taken to the concentration camps? Who chose to take, to, to uh, split the families or how did it work? Uh, this is a particular case. Um uh, which is uh, which is a uh, very very tragic case where part of the family was sent away and part of the family stayed on mm -hmm. in the city, mm -hmm. as I understand you, yes? Mm -hmm. Part of them were staying mm -hmm. on in the city and uh, part of them were sent to the, cons to the camps. Actually, what I yes, heard, they, uh, during the war, they were in a place called Radauz, which is... Well, Radauz is, is southern Bukovina. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like uh, 50 kilometers So what, you're, south. you want to so tell me that... They were from, from Charovitz and they went uh, uh, to Radauz and they stayed there. That, that they happened. stayed there? Yeah. So either they bribed, <laughs> they were rich people who could bribe, otherwise there was no way. No. They had to bribe because the, the local, the Romanian uh, authorities were extremely, extremely... Uh, how to tell you, um, uh, corrupt, <laughs> and therefore you could bribe. But how it, ha how it happened in this family is a tragic thing. How it happened, I don't know. There were lists of people who could stay if they were necessary for the town or for a place. I was in Rados last, last year, and I, I had a lecture there uh, in the main synagogue. And I spoke to local people about all of these things, although I myself from the same areas, but it doesn't matter. So uh, the situation was such that the lists were absolutely, they were in the hands not of Jews. There was uh, no Jewish, uh, uh, no Judenrat. There wasn't such a thing, not Jews. It was the local uh, authorities who, who decided upon it, who will stay and who will go. But very, very few people in Radovitz remained. Very, very few. I mean, they, they must have been very rich in order to, to be able to, 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 to pay off their stay there. And there was another problem. If they stayed on, there was, they had to find a way of living there. Because to do so, because it was forbidden to work. 
how could they survive, yes? And also there was a, a, a law to put a, a star, you know, David star also uh, all the time. I don't know. I don't know, a very tragic story. If you would have known the, the, the details, you would have better described it because it's a rare, uh, rare, rare, very rare case. Because exactly the adults, very few people were left. Most of them were whatever it is. Um, I have a diary in my possession of Radov's people who were exiled to Transnistria. There was a secretary of the community that kept the diary day to day. And I have it in Yiddish. And there he describes everything what happened in the camp. Not everybody there died. About 40% of them survived, of those people who were sent away. It also de depends who you were. For example, no, I don't want to describe because it's a very tragic thing. It's another area. But uh, it's interesting. Thank you. So we have time for two more questions. There is one and there is one. I would just ask you to, uh, to approach uh, Professor Moskovich uh, after the lecture. And <coughs> Thank you for your lecture. Uh, can you mention something about the Jewish cemetery in Chernobyl? Because it's a very big one, so about 50,000 of graves, and inscription more in most in German. Who cares this cemetery? Oh. Yes. Uh, yes. <coughs> I told you this uh, museum is created there in a, in a building which was before it was destroyed. It was Beit uh, Tahara. You know what Beit Ahara is? In the same building, they create a museum. Uh, they, it is a, uh, perhaps uh, one of the biggest preserved, well-preserved cemeteries in, uh, in Eastern Europe. The biggest one is perhaps in Warsaw. And there is also in Budapest, perhaps. And uh, yeah, but Budapest is not exactly Eastern Europe. So. Uh, <coughs> most of the uh, most of the uh, monuments there are more or less more or less tombstones are in order. But from time to time, uh, vandals would come there, particularly in the years where there was change of power there, where there was no strong whatever it is government there. In 1990s, would come vandals. And they would damage the tombs, not of ordinary tombs, but of tombs which are very, very big and, uh, and beautiful, of black granite with beautiful things, and would look for gold. So there were many cases like that. But uh, luckily, I didn't mean, I didn't, I, 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 I come there because my parents are there. Четыре дня, четыре дня, четыре дня.